Beloved church, beloved youth, I'll read two verses from the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and verse 29. The scripture says as follows, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Please be seated. I bring to you greetings tonight from your friendly neighbor up north from Canada, along with a group of teens who have joined us to be with you this evening and this weekend for fellowship, along with a group of families that have joined us as well. We earnestly desire that God will bless each and every one of you. And the passion that you demonstrate during moments of worship and during moments when you stand before the Lord would continue as you go home, as you in private would engage and meet the Lord. That is our greatest desire. And that this fellowship be truly in line with the teaching of the scriptures as it influences, teaches us, and guides us to honor God in everything that we have to do. As being the last speaker tonight, you can realize it's not an easy task. All the beautiful words were said before, all the beautiful messages came before me, and now I'm not sure if I just, just, just say amen and just close the Bible and sit back down. But the message that was given to me and the task that was given to me was to speak about the fear of God as we serve Him, as we minister before Him, if you will, as we worship Him as we have done these past few nights, as we've come together and sang for his name and worshiped him together, whether you want to call it service or ministry or worship, we can think of the exact same idea of approaching God in coming before him. And that attitude that should encompass us as we do that is called the fear of the Lord. And in practice, what does that mean and how does that look is the desire that I have to bring before you tonight in this message. This morning at 5 a.m., the Lord woke me up, and the message I will give to you came to me as I was pleading with the Lord this morning. I'm not saying this to uh, prove a point that I'm someone better than others or to say, wow, listen well because it's something special, but the message that I have on my heart is the message that the Lord has imprinted on my soul. May it be well received by your hearts. And at the end of the day, we're not here to receive acclaim or applauses or fame or statues or none of the above we are here with only one desire that his name be glorified amen as it sometimes happens in certain families the one that I'll make reference to now is no different a family that had a grandfather who immigrated from his country from his land to a different land because there was hope of something better a family that had a good family tradition with good values that were brought into this family and that were given unto this family. The nephew of this man I'm talking about now was growing up with his older brother. At times, so it seemed they had difficulties relationally speaking, as it sometimes happens in our families as well. One day, however, because of a major conflict that he had, he has to leave the home. And as he travels and ends up in a different place where he started from, he's very tired. He's taken aback. He's contemplating everything that has just happened. Tired as he is, he goes to sleep. And in the middle of his sleep, all of a sudden, God reveals himself to him. The Lord speaks to him, and he sees an amazing vision of what God is in the power of God. And as this man by the name of Jacob wakes up, he makes this beautiful proclamation. The Lord was here, and I did not know it. The Lord was present here, and I was not aware. And the Bible says that he was greatly afraid because of this encounter with the living God. We've sung about him tonight. We've sung for his glory. We've worshipped, as we say. But the question is, do you really know who the Lord is? You see, at one point, Pastor Leonard Ravenhill was saying that he had asked a group of students from theology school, please tell me who God is. 
And they said, well, God is almighty. God is omnipresent and God is uh, all powerful. And, and he said, don't tell me the qualities of God. Tell me who God is. Well, you know, God is our savior and God is, don't tell me what God does. Tell me who God is. And the reality is that if we are to enunciate who God is, we would have a very difficult time because you can only enunciate who God is if you really know who God is. Let me ask you a question, those of you who are American brothers. Do you know who Trump is? A hot name in politics in the world nowadays. Do you know, is, it, is there anybody here who can raise their hands and say, and say, I know who Trump is? You know, you could tell me many things about this man. You could tell me many things about his lifestyle, about certain things that you've read online and heard in the news. But the question is, is there anybody who can actually say they know him? And I would probably venture to say in a room this big, it's a no. To say you know him means you must have met him, spent time with him, and he would have had been willing to open his heart to you, to get to really get in the inside of who he is, so that you could really claim that you know him. The reality, my friends, is that we really do not know who God is. And while we sing about him, while we worship him, while we bring adoration to him in the words, in the songs, and in the events that we put together, it often is demonstrated that we really don't know who God is. If we knew who God is, our lives would be surrounded by a holy reverence, awe, and fear. This is why it's called the fear of the Lord. When we talk about Jesus, how do you describe him? Who is Jesus to you? Well, Jesus is my friend. He's the one who is there for me. He's my rock. He's the one I stand on. He's the one who died for me. You see, these kinds of words and attributes and descriptions speak more so a close connection of yours that has been kind to you at certain times. I remember of a man in the book of, in the book of John, who by the name of Thomas, one of the apostles, the day he saw the risen Christ, makes a proclamation. Do you remember what it is? He didn't say, here's my friend, the Jesus we walked with. Here's the one who fed us, taught us, was with us. But the moment he sees the risen Christ, he says, my God and my Lord. My friends, who is Jesus? Who is God to you? We sing about him, the one who saves us, the one who's with us, the one who walks with us, the one who's there for us. But the question is, who is God to us? Because unless we really get to know him, we would have a difficult time in terms of an authentic Bible inferred worship you see the text we read tonight speaks about the fact that God is a consuming fire and as we come to serve him our service must be acceptable to him with reverence and fear and as we come together in this message I would like to bring these two themes into our attention the fact that God is an all-consuming fire and the fact that the service that we are supposed to give to him must be inferred from these two important qualities of reverence and fear. The same sentiment, just differently explained. These two key, these two key themes will guide our message tonight. When it comes to the idea of worship and service, again, these we can use interchangeably in terms of the things that we do for God or that we offer to God. But what really matters is the quality of service that comes to him underlying not the songs, not the way we present ourselves here, not the way that we have organized the event, but something more fundamental that stems from, from in, in, inside of us of who we actually are. The Bible makes the claim that we have an unshakable kingdom. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, uh, you guys live literally the American dream. The rest of the world, and there I say it, even those in Canada look towards the States as the safe haven of the world. Since the last three or four years, we've had about 40 families that have moved to the States on the idea of being in a better place from Canada. 
where it's green, we have squirrels, we have raccoons, and everything else that's cute and fun in between. They move to the States because it's a good place to be in. The economy is great, you can make money, the business world provides for you. Hey, the American dream is still alive, as much as it might still be. But the reality is that no matter how great the States might be, and no offense to you, it's a very shakable kingdom. Because when COVID hit, just like us and the rest of the world, you were in the exact same situation. When wars come about and you go to war, and while from the past many years the States has been stellar at winning wars, the reality is that you still incur casualties and it costs you and it's difficult because we live in shakable kingdoms. But the Bible speaks of a kingdom that is not shakable, a kingdom that is lasting and it will last forever. And that kingdom is the one that is to come. The kingdom that in that prayer that we say, Our Father who is in heaven, we are supposed to earnestly desire by saying your kingdom come and your will be done as is in heaven so that it be done on earth. And tonight we sang about this kingdom through the many beautiful songs that were brought before us in speaking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his kingdom, of his glory, of his qualities. All these describe and discuss this unshakable kingdom that the Lord prepares for us. But it's interesting that as you read these last two verses, they're connected to the previous verses where the idea is put in comparison of a previous event that had been happening at the Mount Sinai where the law was given, where God had come down to speak and minister to the people directly, audibly. And then in comparison, we look at the modern church that has received the grace of God and the apostle says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. And this expression is very interesting because the way you would naturally read in this context is, let us be thankful. The idea of grace can comport an idea of thankfulness. Let us be thankful that the Lord has saved us. 2,500 or some of us are here present tonight because the Lord has saved us because the Lord has been good to us. More than 2,500 are outside partying on the streets making really horrible decisions that not some religious groups frowns upon, but that literally destroy their lives. The reason why you are here is not that you had a better opportunity or better parents or a better context, but because God was good to you and I and gave us salvation through Christ, praise be His name. Grace means thankfulness. But the natural reading of the verse in the original is exactly the word grace, which is that unmerited favor that has been given to us by God. A word we really love in the modern context of the church. Let us have grace. Because we have an unshakable kingdom. Because in comparison to that old covenant, we are in a brand new covenant. Let us have, assume and enjoy the grace that God has given us. And naturally you put these two covenants in comparison. These two paradigms in comparison. We look at Mount Sinai and we look at Ekro at Elim today. We look at the old covenant and the new covenant today. And the one word that seems to revolve in our minds is the word grace. God has given us grace. Through Christ we are entered, we have entered into grace. We are in a brand new covenant. We've overcome the old covenant and by God's grace we have grace. And it's amazing because we love the grace of God. And the modern church relishes on the idea of the grace of God. Which usually in our minds translates to this worry-free attitude that now that we have grace, we can literally worship, enjoy the Lord and nothing else really matters. And whenever someone says that it should matter, we become quite annoyed. The idea of principles and rules and other things really should not be brought into the question when it comes to the idea of grace. The fact that they didn't have the grace we have, they're a problem. Sometime, some time ago, a member from our church who had come to Canada via a boat and not in a cruise ship, but in a container, he had crossed illegally to come into Canada, had complained how difficult it was. The fact that they didn't have food, the fact that they didn't have water, it was a treacherous journey, they almost died halfway across the ocean. And someone else who was visiting now more recently said, you know, 
Why do you keep complaining about crossing the ocean in a container ship? If you had waited like me, you would have come on a plane. They would have given you food and water. It would have been much easier. You just had to come earlier and come in the container ship. When it comes back to the idea of what they had and what we have, what was their problem? They were under law. They had to deal with all that. We are under grace. And the grace of God is good, is amazing, because it saves us from all of that which was at Mount Sinai. What is interesting though is that this distinction that comes from the idea of grace is a problem that we unfortunately have not properly understood. You see, if we were to look back at Mount Sinai within this context, we would say, well, it was like that old style Romanian communist way of worshiping. That's what it was, rule based and difficult. Just imagine if in the midst of Moses speaking to God, the people being gathered there, the trumpet sounding, all of that, some guy goes off and starts doing a saxophone solo. I could probably imagine that Moses would use a staff he used to liberate the Egyptians and knock him on the head, knock it out. We're in the presence of God. It was sober. It was holy. It was reverent. That was then. Now we are under grace. We have it better because we are under grace, a free, non-binding, non-legal system of pure and un an unaltered, free, precious grace style of worship where it really does not matter how we are, how we look, how we dress, how we behave. It matters that Jesus is just enamored with us and he cannot just go away from us. And he just wants us to worship just the way we are. You see, you might shake your head and say, what did you say? But the reality is that when we hear this word of grace, naturally, subconsciously, this might be what is translated in our minds because of the system that we unfortunately live in. Tough for them, nice for us. If only they were born under our system. It's not our fault that they were born under the dictatorship of Romanian style worship where it was rigid and frigid. So many years ago, when in a church in Romania, no instruments were permitted to be brought, uh, very rigid and frigid, uh, a person brought an accordion, not a guitar, not drums, God forbid, an accordion. And an old person from the church had not seen one of these before. Taken aback by this monstrosity in their church, he took his cane and so that he would not defile himself, grabbed the accordion with his cane and was pulling it outside of the church to make sure he keeps the church pure and clean. And you might say that's exactly what this legalistic style old Romanian way of worship is just like at Sinai, but thank God we are now under grace because at that time it was the issue of some problems of theology of people who just didn't know the Bible like we know it today and unfortunately just couldn't explain it properly. So they had a rough time, but hey, praise God, we're at Ecro today having an amazing time in worship. The issue is that we are getting something very wrong about grace. Because at Sinai and at Ekro, it was the exact same platform of grace that made that meeting with God possible. At Mount Sinai, when God came down to speak to the people, it was his grace that was afforded to them. Had God not been gracious to speak to them, he would not have been there. They would have been long gone, eaten by the locusts and the scorpions and everything else in the desert. It was the grace of God that provided that he come down and speak to them. And it's the exact same grace of God that some many years later brought Jesus Christ on another mountain on Golgotha to die for us that we today here worship at Ekro and give honor to his name. You see, it's not that we have grace and they didn't. It's the exact same grace that was then and now. Nothing has really changed. So the question goes then, what are we actually perceiving differently? What is the difference that it seems that it was different then and it's very different now? Ah, it has probably to do with the rules and we equate the old battle of legalism versus grace. They had to follow arduous rules and we are now in a rule-free worship environment where it's about the authenticity of us meeting our friend Jesus. This is how the modern church views the idea of worship, service, servitude and 
coming together for the glory of God. Really this idea of rules and regulations has nothing to do with us because brother, we are under grace. And as a result, these are no longer binding on us. The issue is that this is absolutely, completely and fundamentally wrong. The same rules of worship that applied at Sinai still apply to Ekro today. And I want you to understand that usually when we say something like this, the first thought that comes into your mind is, that's it. He's going to speak about our piano. He's going to speak about our drums. He's gonna... This is what we reduce the idea of servitude to. A worship band and an atmosphere of worship. That's all we see when it comes to worship. It's so much more profound than that. Which is why I can venture to say that the same rules that applied at Sinai still apply today in the exact same fundamental way of servitude whereby the form definitely has changed something has remained unchanged the grace of God is still rule bound the reason for this conflict in our minds when it comes to grace and perceiving it biblically is because we live in a very relativistic society that has taught us be yourself and be authentic and these expressions have made us think of two key things. One, do not conform to anyone's standard. And two, follow your heart's desire. That's what society teaches us. Don't conform. Be yourself. Don't be some cheap copy of your grandpa from communist Romania. Be yourself. And at the same time, if your heart tells you it's good, follow your heart and carry it through. Do you know what the issue with these two paradigms is? That while society trumpets them all the time, society breaks these rules. Watch. When it says don't conform to anyone, do you know that daily you are forced to conform to the world around you? That's why the Bible so clearly finds this expression in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world. Why would it say that unless there was a pressure from the world to conform you to the world? Let me give you a little example from practical recent history. There was a man by the name of Edward Bernays. He is the father of modern propaganda. A name which most likely almost none of you would have heard. A name that has so much influence on your lives though you have no idea. Let me read you a quote from this man from his book that he wrote on propaganda. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses, that's you, is an important element in a democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are modeled, our tastes are formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. We are dominated by the relativities of small number of persons who understand the mental processes and societal patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. Let me break this down what this means. When you go out and buy a phone, when you go out and buy shoes, when you go out and buy clothes, when you go out and buy a car, you do not buy those things because you like them. You don't buy those things because they fit you. You buy those things because you've been programmed to buy those things. The forces at hand have molded your mind, your understanding over the many years of your life to make you believe that's what you want. You're pressured to conform. Yet they then come and trumpet and say, hey, don't be conformed to anybody. You be yourself. You be yourself. Here's another advertisement. Hey, would you like to buy some new shoes? But be yourself. Be yourself. Look at the trends. All of us look the same. All of us generally look the same. And when someone breaks the trend, those who start to follow, don't follow because they like the trend, because it's cool. Because the pressure of society makes you conform. That's why the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world. So this percept of be authentic, be yourself, unfortunately fails when you realize that the world actually is trying to conform you. But secondly, this idea of follow your heart's desire. I remember that at one point, there was a snake talking to a woman. It's not a fairy tale, it's the Bible. And this snake told the woman, hey, in loose terms, 
Follow your heart. Why would you have to listen to a God who has all these percepts and rules? It was just one actually. Why would you listen and follow? Follow your heart. The expression comes down to be your own God. And that's the fundamental temptation from the day of the fall until today. Every single sin finds its root in this expression of be your own God. Why would you have to listen to God, to anybody who speaks on behalf of God? Hey, you be your own God. You choose your destiny. You do as your heart desires. Not realizing that the idea here is to take God away and then put you in the throne of God. The relativistic society that we live in has pressured us to think that rules, regulations, societal standards are disgusting, are horrible, and they should never be brought into civilized conversation. As for barbaric dictatorships, we live in a free, notice the word free, society. And this mentality then is applied in this idea of grace, unfortunately misunderstood. In that in grace, we are now no longer bound by any kind of regulation. And as a result, we can do whatever we want in worshiping the Lord. We are gravely mistaken when we fail to realize that grace is actually rule-based. Grace is rule-based. Hence, it being called a teacher. In the book of Titus, in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes to Titus as follows in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now watch. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What does this sound like? but like a pattern of lifestyle that one must follow. Notice this, it's not a soteriological issue here that if we do those things we shall be saved. But because the grace of God has been shown unto us, it has changed us and saved, saved us. We now naturally follow such a pattern outflowing from a heart that has been changed by God. Which is why now there's a standard of living for those who belong to God. You might hate that, but that's fundamentally it. And you know who usually hates these things? Those who've not yet been saved. Because the flesh will not conform. A person who's not saved has a difficult time with the idea of the rules of grace. They're not difficult, but the rules of grace disturb the flesh. We've often used this example. I have nine children. My children fit naturally in my family. Not once have they told me it's awkward to live in this house. They believe it's the way to be. As a matter of fact, they might see your family very awkward if they came to your house. Because it looks different than my family. Probably, just assuming. I assume you still have a bit of Romanianism in your need sarmale or some of the effect. Karnats and something else. So there's a bit of leeway there. But fundamentally, my house rules might be different than your house rules. They would find it awkward in your house, but not in mine. You know why? Because they naturally fit. They're my family. The moment you become part of God's family, you naturally fit. The rules don't seem like rules. They seem like a pattern of life. I don't know it otherwise. The environment has changed. Until it changes, everything seems arduous. Rules, difficulty, things that stifle our worship. But it's exactly this grace that is rule-based that was present at Sinai. And it's also present in Ekro. Now, this is the moment that we make that face that babies make when they have a lemon for the first time in their lives. Why rue on a night of authentic, pure, genuine worship with this Romanianism, Pentecostalism, religious style of living? Hey, at least once a year, a week in the year, can we be permitted to enjoy ourselves in a way of worship that steps out of the norms of our churches? So when we go back, at least we've had a break from our churches. Why bring this now into tonight's discussion? After all, wasn't it a fun experience until now? Wasn't it amazing? Wasn't it great worshiping the Lord, praising Him? And once again, believe me, I'm not talking about music per se here. I'm talking about something more fundamental, more deep that we'll get to now in a second. Worship has everything to do with not me, but what God likes. Suppose you wanted to... Um, make me a gift not that anyone one of you would but suppose you would and you'd want to take me to the best restaurant in chicago where would you take me you see no matter where you take me unless it was something that i liked 
you'd have a difficult time convincing me I'm having a good time. If you're that kind of fitness type of guy and you take me to drink kombucha juice and eat kale with you, believe me, I want to eat the thing that eats kombucha juice and kale. That's what I want to eat. I don't want to eat the healthy stuff. Give me the byproduct. Now, if you want to treat me well, give me a steak. Uh, you'd say, but I don't like steak. Duly noted, it's not about you, it's about me. You said you wanted to gift me. So if you want to gift me, make me happy, not you. When you go out on your own accord, hey, have fun. Drink all the kombucha you can. When you take me out, give me steak. Hey, chicken, something that makes breath and moves, you know, something else. Don't give me the lettuce. You see, when it comes back to worship, worship is not about us. Worship is about Him. And all of us would say amen tonight by saying, yes, it's for that, that's why we're here. That's why we sang. That's why we raised our hands. It's all about Him. But do you ever wonder, does He actually like my worship? Does He actually enjoy what I offer Him? Is He happy with what it is? Proverbially speaking, am I offering kombucha juice or what's actually good? Because fundamentally, unless you're worshiping the way God likes it, your worship is meaningless. It can sound nice. It's an amazing performance. But it's not worship. It's not praise. It's just that, an amazing performance. You see, my friends, it should really matter to us if God actually likes our worship. Because fundamentally, I'm here at Ekro tonight, not for me, not to have a good time. I'm here to honor Him, to praise Him. And as I glorify Him as a child of God, I naturally have an amazing moment myself because I'm in the presence of the one I love. Praise be His name. That's what Ekro is about. That's what any convention, any church, any gathering, any moment that has to do with God has to be about. It's not about me. It's about Him. It's about glorifying Him. So watch how these come together. The unshakable kingdom is the reason why we worship. Whereas the all-consuming fire is the basis for how we worship. We worship Him because He's given us an unshakable kingdom. When you realize that He saved you from this world, not of your works, not of the way you had to behave, but by His grace and grace alone, in the blood of Jesus Christ, that makes you worship. That makes you shout hallelujah, hosanna, and praise His name. But now realizing that the one you praise is also an all-consuming fire, it must naturally and normally guide the way I now worship. Which then comes to the crux of our message. How are we to worship? How are we to serve the Lord? What are the rules of worship? And here's where we would say, there we go, now it comes. Now it's about guitars and drums. Watch this. Number one, the first principle, the first rule that has to do with our way of worshiping has everything to do with purity. It's grounded in purity. A word that on surface might not mean much to you. We hear it at weddings and at engagements, be pure, continue to be pure. That's all we kind of think about. But purity has a lot to do with the way that we worship and give honor to the Lord. I'd like to read for you 1 Timothy chapter 4, a verse that Paul writes to young Timothy at the time. Chapter 4, verse 12. And he says, let no one despise your youth. We love this. Hey, we're young. We're having an amazing time. We're praising God. Let the church see that there is a vibrant youth community who wants to honor God. And Paul says, that's great. Let no one despise your youth. No one should look down on you for being young and praising God. But he follows by saying, but be an example. To the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. If you want to worship God the way He likes it, He expects a purity and a level of purity from you as you come and enter into worship. Think back of an Old Testament example. When I was young, I had a really tough time understanding why did God accept Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's sacrifice? It made no sense to me. I loved the Bible, had a colorful Bible when I was young, and the pictures were always that smoke going sideways. And I would think, why? Why was Cain not accepted? Was it that he brought fruit? 
brought kombucha juice or whatever he brought at the time? What was it that he brought to God that didn't make God love his sacrifice? Somehow he loved Abel's. As I grew older, rereading that text, do you know how it properly reads in context? The Lord looked at Abel and his sacrifice, and then the Lord looked at Cain and his sacrifice. Before God looks at your worship, your song, your guitar, the way you sing, the way you've come to church, the way you preach, the way you prophesy, God looks at you as an individual and then at your service. Which means that the idea of purity is ingrained in the context of worship. God does not accept worship that is not grounded in a life of purity. It's unpleasant. It doesn't smell right, if you will. And you'd say, well, that was the old covenant. Do you know it also applies in the new covenant? Um, it was mentioned a couple of times in the past few services. Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife couple who come to church and all they did was, what did they actually do? Let's think about it. If you were to come down and come to the level of what actually transpired, you would be shocked. They saw that Barnabas sold everything he had, brought the money at the feet of the apostles, and they said, that's amazing. Here's the son of comfort. They gave him a nickname, a beautiful nickname, because of the act of servitude. They were amazed. And Ananias and Sapphira said, you know what? Why can't we do the same? Why can't we have our faces plastered on the church foundation? So they sold the property, they withheld a portion of money, and they come to the apostles, putting it down, assuming that all is there. That's all that it was. They didn't scream. They didn't yell or, or uh, bad words or curse words. They didn't do anything inappropriate. Hey, they were even dressed properly for church. Nothing else was out of the order. They just didn't bring the full amount. They didn't even make fuss about it. That's all they did. And Peter looks at them and says, is that the truth? Sure it is. And one simple lie, just not revealing the entire truth, was enough for God to kill them on the spot. Hey, those are harsh words. That's in the Bible. Because when it comes to our worship, our service, God expects nothing less but absolute purity from us. May God help us. So it's got nothing to do with guitars and drums and other things. We'll get to that in a second as well. It has to do with purity. With the way that we come before the Lord. Some years ago, I was present at a youth retreat, actually Pastor Olariu from Arizona was there with us. And a young man was demon possessed. As we entered into prayer for that young man, you know what was surprising? Just before we entered prayer, the Holy Spirit had spoken that the young guys who were there, it was a boys retreat, a young guys retreat. The guys who are there are supposed to go out to confession because many have things that are unconfessed and sins in their lives. Some went out, but some didn't. When the pastor who was with us as well came up with one of these young men who had a very troubled background, he told us, now you will see why I keep telling you that people who practice iniquities are possessed and under the influence of demons. And he puts him in the middle of a room and we start praying for him. At the beginning, it seemed like a normal prayer. It seemed out of place what was said about this young man. But as we started praying just in a few minutes, his head fell down and he himself fell down completely. He started rolling on the floor. He was vomiting all different colors. It was a horrible experience. But what was surprising was that during the time of this prayer, when the whole room that was now praying inadvertently because he had nothing else to do but pray, this young man started to approach certain of the young guys and said, he did not properly confess. He also has sins. He also watched pornography. He also did this. Because the demon inside of him knew what the other guys were also doing. Hey, it's the same clan, the same group. You see, you think you can mask it in front of God. You come here and you sing and you give glory to God and you praise his name. Do you know who's not impressed? God. All of us can say, that's amazing. Beautiful performance, amazing voice. God bless you, keep singing for the glory of God. The one who actually sees what's in the heart is God. This is why I'm afraid to even say that tonight some of you were wrong or in the wrong. I cannot make that claim. To me, all of you are amazing, beautiful saints. God bless you all. You worship the Lord. I want to believe you're authentically loving Jesus. But the reality is, and we know it very well, that many of us have internal battles that we're still struggling with. Ask yourself, since you've been here at Ekro in Chicago, Friday night, Saturday night, and today, throughout the day, have bad thoughts 
lusts, hey, even pornography and other things have been part of your life? If the Holy Spirit were to descend properly tonight and start to speak openly about what's happening in our lives, how many of us would be willing to stay in church? Some years ago, a pastor who was used mightily by God went to a youth event at a church. And all of a sudden, during the sermon, he steps down from the pulpit. He goes to one of the youth, puts his hand on his head and says, Liu, last night we were watching pornography. He moves over, you last night we were masturbating. The Holy Spirit was revealing. Do you know what happened? They didn't say, praise God, let's worship the one who's revealing it. They left the church. They ran out of the church. Because when it comes back to worship, God expects nothing else but absolute purity in our lives. May God help us. Yes, Christ is the one who atones. Christ is the one who washes us clean. Christ is the one who makes us perfect in front of God. Christ is the one who then expects us to live in that purity. Watch this. Do you love Jesus? Who loves Jesus here? Now raise your hands. If there's a hand down, God forgive you. All of us love Jesus. How can you not love Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus loves you and will take you to heaven? I'm not going to make you raise your hands because I make, make some of you lie maybe. I like to believe that I'm going to heaven. I'm not really sure. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Whoever has this hope of the day to come, of the salvation brought by Christ, let him purify himself just as he is pure. As Christ is pure, you live in purity. You cannot claim you belong to him. You're praising his glory. And yet at the same time, there's a lack of purity in mind in your life. May God forgive us tonight. May the Holy Spirit descend upon this room and sanctify us tonight. And make us live holy in front of God. For our God is an all-consuming fire. I'm often taken aback by the songs we sing. I was mentioning to one of the pastors last night, listening to the songs that were sung. Not bad songs in terms of the message and the essence. But listen to us. Do we actually do what we sing? One of the songs said we battle on our knees. We wage war in prayer. Do you? When was the last time you went on your knees to wage war with the devil? Not rebuking and proclaiming this name it and claim it gospel. Real spiritual battles, going on your knees, interceding in prayer until the Lord gives you victory. When was the last time? Because we sing about it. And God knows we oftentimes lie in church. Lord, we lift our hands to you. Have you? You were just sitting there with your hands crossed together. Look at the way that we worship. When it comes back to worship, God expects nothing less but absolute purity. May God help us. Number two, the rules of worship stemming from an unshakable kingdom which makes us worship and realizing God is an all-consuming fire, which means the basis of how we're supposed to worship include the idea of principles. Purity is one thing. Principles is a whole different thing. Principles have to do with the way that we behave, engage, present ourselves, walk, whatever you want to call it. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17. The Spirit of God wages war against the flesh and the flesh wages war against the Spirit of God. Now watch, read that last line. So that you do not do the things that you wish. You cannot live however you want. It's not part of the package. The grace, salvation, and God's free gift does not include now you live as you please. You please as He wants. You live as He wants. Because if the Spirit of God is truly over you, you will desire righteousness and nothing less but righteousness. The principles of God are invoked when it comes to the idea of worship. This is where it gets down to the nitty gritty. And some of you might say, really, it's got nothing to do with the batik. It's got nothing to do with makeup and the way that we dress and the way that we speak and the fist bumps. It's got nothing to do with that. But my friends, once again, I come back to the Bible to appeal to the principles that God has in the scriptures, which are unchanging. So many, 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 many years ago, King David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to his place. And he makes an amazing conference. You guys did good. He did amazing. You have no idea how worship, how refined it was there. A choir sang beautifully tonight. No sarcasm. God bless you guys. It was beautiful. God bless them. Amen. God bless them. Amen. 
I, I despise this whole idea of cheap clapping. It means absolutely nothing. Give them an amen, make them be blessed by God. That's what we want. My friends, King David, the priests, and all included, were prancing and dancing and giving God the glory of all time. Everybody was having an amazing time in worship. And in the midst of this whole situation, the Ark of the Covenant, the most important centerpiece of their religion, the symbol of God's presence among them, is almost thrown down. And one of the priests permitted to be engaged in the work of the Ark of the Covenant does the most noble thing possible. Remember what it was? He stretches out his hand to stop it. Let me ask you guys, was it wrong? What was wrong in what he did? He wanted to make sure that the Ark of the Covenant was kept intact, pure, untouched. That's all he wanted. Yet God kills him on the spot. And he begs the question, why? Why would God do that? He did a service for God. Yet God kills him on the spot. If you're to go back a few pages, some really good pages, you'd come back to when the Ark of the Covenant was created and the rules that the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be engaged with. You didn't just prance around with the Ark of the Covenant. There were specific rules of dealing with the Ark. Do you remember how they were transporting the Ark now when David was moving it? In a cart. In a cart with oxen. Because you know, we're no longer in 1920s as my kids like to say. Hey, we're no longer in Romania. So be it. We're still Romanian. We still eat sarmal and slanina in my house. We're Romanian. As Romanian as it gets. You see, we're no longer in 1920s, 1940s, 1950s. We're no longer in that system. We've further advanced and we're here by God's grace and grace alone. So they said, what's the point of that whole carrying on your shoulder? Then you have to go to a physio and massage therapy and it's unpleasant. Hey, since we've advanced, technology's advanced, might as well put the ark in a cart and we'll carry it properly. Even the best. Nobody gets to touch it. It's the best way to do it. Do you remember where this idea came from? Just a little bit before, the Philistines had stolen the ark. And when it was brought back, it was put in a cart. A question that maybe you haven't asked yourself, but I definitely have because I'm very inquisitive as a person. Why didn't God kill the Philistines when they touched the ark? Do you think about that? Because Uzzah, the priest, got killed on the spot when he tried to stop it from falling, nothing else. Yet the Philistines who touched it all over, not one got killed. How is this? This makes no sense. Do you know why? The rules of worship are binding on those who belong to Jesus Christ. That's why the world has no business singing the songs of Christ, imitating the work of Christ. Let them be saved and come into the fellowship of the church of Christ. God has no business with the world but saving the world from sin. God's rules are binding on his children. That's why as a proper Romanian parent, I discipline my kids. But I've never dared discipline someone else's kids. They're not my kids. Let the, their parents discipline them. My kids, however, I need to take care of. We are God's children. And if you are truly children, this same passage we read tonight speaks of that earlier in Hebrews 12. If you are truly children, he will chastise you. He will teach you. He will correct you. Ensuring you walk in the way that he wants. You see, grace is rule-based. And I would like to say God is a God of details. Listen to me well. To my knowledge at least, Brother Christy helped me, not one Romanian pastor I know has a batik business. Not one of us have investments in the batik industry. Not one of us make money or bitcoins off of it. The only reason we keep mentioning it, because it's written in this book. Had it not been written, not one of us would have mentioned it tonight. You want to wear a little flower in your suit? Hey, go for it. It's your problem. Wear a flower, don't wear a flower. Nobody cares. Because it's not in the book. But what is in the book is principial and it doesn't change. Please stop treating the principles of God as if they were human customs. They're principles and they're binding. God help us listen. You can like it, not like it. You cannot call me back. I could care less. I live happily in Canada. 
I'm faithfully preaching the Word of God tonight. That's what I'm tasked to do. And once we're done, you might not even give me a high five or a thank you. I do not care. That's, when I, that's not why I came. I came to be a faithful minister to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stop treating the principles of God as if they are human customs. Romanian traditions. It was just the way that we were raised up. No, it wasn't. It's written in this book. And if you want to worship God properly, the worship of God is bound in the principles that God brings. That's why Uzzah was killed. Because you don't mess with the principles of God. Change the flowers. Change the piano color. Change these things. They're not in the book. What's in the book will never change. Don't touch the book. He wrote it. It's his book. God be glorified. And may we listen to the word of God. The principles of God are bounding. Listen to me. Romanian youth, we love you. Romanian Pentecostal spirit-filled worship is principled, is not unprincipled. It's principled all the way through, which is why grace is principled. Do you know why it's principled? Because the world we live in has rules. Here's a rule that we all know, even if we don't realize we know. The law of gravity is a rule that will never change. It does not care if you are round or thin or tall or big or if you have hair or like me are losing hair. It does not care. You make a step over. This morning I was preaching in this church and Pastor Inesco said at the pulpit, make sure you are careful. There's three steps. And as I was looking down, I said, my goodness, optical illusion. This carpet is amazing, but you really do not see the steps. Had he not mentioned that to me, jolly as I am, I might have just jumped to the pulpit and it wouldn't have been a pleasant experience. Rules don't bend because you are you. Rules stay the same. These laws are built into our environment, into our system. Salvation is an environment of its own. We are waiting to go to the unshakable kingdom. Not here. This is corrupt. This is dying. Buy the best iPhone. Not in two years. In half a year, the battery is done. It doesn't work anymore. And God knows with all the Snapchat and Instagram pictures you guys have to post, it really drains the battery. You see, these things get corrupted. Everything breaks. What is unshaken is the kingdom of God that is to come. And that kingdom has specific rules. And when we are saved, now let's become super reformed if you are. We are now transported to be with Christ in the heavenlies, it says. So we are already there, though yet still here. And Paul makes the claim, so now that I've been crucified with Christ, the life that I have yet to live in the flesh here, I will live it according to the Son of God, to the way that He's made me be. Which means, help us await your kingdom come and your will be done as is in heaven, so let it be here. I live here as if I'm already there, though I'm still here. That's it. This is why the rules of the kingdom apply to me. Saved now, I'm bound by these principles. And they don't change because my name is Andre or I'm a pastor, I'm from Canada. They stay the same for all of us. God help us listen. It's up to you. But at the end of the day, it's not me you have to give an account to. Uh, some of you might, pastorally speaking. It's not Pastor Christie you have to give an account to. Those, those of you in this church will have to give an account to him, pastorally speaking. All of us must give an account to the one who's an all-consuming fire. Don't play with God. And lastly, worship that is driven by this unshakable kingdom which drives us to worship. But it's inferred in the way that we worship through this all-consuming fire is worship that has protocol there's purity there's principles and there's protocol and the protocol I like to refer to here is the protocol of humility the protocol that makes me in awe of him and humbles me to the ground which is why he keeps telling you we're not here for ourselves to have a good time to feel good have a good time at Portillo's. That's where you have a good time. In here, we want to honor his name. Have a good time tomorrow at the park. God bless you all. Enjoy it. Here we worship his name. Here we praise his name. Which is why the protocol of humility bows me down and makes me come to his feet. And one method that really, really humbles us. A method that unfortunately is gravely missing from our lives. Is prayer and fasting beloved church it pains me that the modern church has replayed, re, uh, replaced prayer and fasting with worship 
This is where I now come back to the idea of songs. Listen to me. I might look weird and be a staunch Romanian conservative, because I am. It does not pain me one bit you play with drums or a guitar or the piano or backtracks. God bless you all. Worship the Lord. Fundamentally, the issue is we replaced prayer with worship. And we think that this is prayer. This means we're giving it all to God. This means we are growing in faith. No, you're not. Singing is part of our spiritual disciplines. But nothing humbles you more like bending your knees, going on the ground and recognizing I'm a no one. I need God's grace. And be willing to go to the extreme of saying today I'll renounce all my desires, my pleasures, my appetites. I will stand before the Lord until the King of Glory comes down and listens to my petition. Until the King of Glory appears and touches my heart and changes me. I will stand there until he comes. That's humility. That's what the church is missing nowadays. And this is what really, really hurts me. Because we replaced this whole idea of prayer with worship. I was present at prayers for people who were demonized. Listen to me. The worship band is not present there. The worship band is not giving us nice tunes and playing on the piano. Do you know what makes the difference there? The presence of the Holy Spirit coming down in prayer. That's what makes the difference. That's where the real test comes into play. Your theological degrees and your diplomas and pastoral identification cards mean nothing to the devil. Only the power of the Holy Spirit is the one that comes down and changes everything. And do you know how the Holy Spirit comes down? In prayer. Look in the book of Acts. Where does it say they were all singing and the Holy Spirit came down and baptized them? Every single account, they were in prayer, in fervent, insistent prayer. And the Lord came down and baptized them with the Holy Spirit. I'm not denying the role of music in church. I'm not denying the role of worship in church as we call it. My problem is that we've unfortunately changed prayer into a worship experience. Let me add this also. Unfortunately, we started worshiping the worship experience. We're not worshiping God. We're worshiping the worship experience. And this does not matter what kind of style of music you play. I was at a wedding some little time ago. We had a group of people from Romania who had joined us. Very, very good instrumental players. Now, they all took four accordions. And I cannot begin to describe you how sublime that music sounded. I'm really Romanian. I truly believe that in heaven we will be all playing on accordions. And with all due respect, our Pentecostal background necessitates an accordion somewhere on the platform. Then you really are Romanian. The music was exquisite. Now we would say true, real style of worship. And the pastor that was joining me at the uh, table there at the wedding said, um, I have a question. Are these guys playing because they love God or because they love the accordion? I would think uh, they really love the accordion and God, but I think they really love the accordion. It doesn't matter what instrument you use, because fundamentally, if you start worshiping the worship experience, but not the one who deserves the worship, we have a big problem. And do you know how I can tell that we worship the worship experience? Please watch. The moment the worship team comes on stage and starts to play just a few notes, do you know the first reaction? Hands go up automatically. Some start crying. Some start moving. We're feeling the Holy Spirit. Really? So why then explain to me the moment that the piano stops, hands go down, the Holy Spirit is gone. Because last I checked, when the Holy Spirit comes down, the church is on fire. You cannot quench that kind of fire. When the Holy Spirit descends and moves and changes, things really take and become beautiful. Then things change. My friends, why? The moment the music stops, the worship stops. The atmosphere changes. Let me tell you this. Just watch yourselves with all due respect. I'm not accusing anyone, but look at us. The moment the worship is done here, you came to the altar, you're all crying, begging the Lord to save you, to uh, deliver you from pornography and, and suicide and many and real things. And the moment we say, amen, yo, high five, how are you doing? Where are we eating tonight? I'm confused. I thought you were in the presence of God. How do you switch from God's throne room to Portillo's on a dime? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm hurt. It hurts me because we've changed worship. 
and we're worshiping worship we're worshiping the music we're worshiping the worship experience let God receive all the glory this doesn't mean stop singing but realize what we're doing we're oftentimes manipulating ourselves without realizing this is why I come back to prayer it's the most basic thing that we have because you can't manipulate with prayer either you have it or you don't when you go into prayer and the spirit comes it's either there or not there I remember a night and some of the youth who are present here with us from Kitchener would remember this we were at a youth camp hey we're not that conservative we do youth camps as well and as we were together in that night on the fourth night of the camp usually we like to end it properly just like you do sing a song together and praise God and I'm not against the idea of singing again I'm not against it but that night I spoke on the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and I'm a staunch Pentecostal believer I've seen way too many miracles and ministries of God working in my life and those around me that I can tell you the Holy Spirit is as real as it gets God is real praise be his name I'll give you one because I have to I just I feel like I have to because some of you might say well the Holy Spirit has stopped working cessationism is a thing now uh, no more speaking in tongues is babbling those of you who are from our church would know this and I'm not going to make them stand up like the old people used to do. So this is real. They are here. They can testify. Last year at church, we had Starinza, prayer for the Holy Spirit. And what do we do at Starinza? Pray. No, that's it. Nothing else. No gimmicks. No nothing else. We just pray for the Holy Spirit. And the way we do it at church is as we have the choir and the band kind of like you guys have it here. We bring those who are praying to be baptized for the first time on the first row and those who've already been baptized on the second, third, fourth row to continue praying that God would continue to help them grow. And then the ministers pray around them and that's it. No one will repeat after me, none of that stuff. It has to be natural, pure, like the Bible gives it. That's real Starinza. And I don't agree with Botelza, Botelza, Botelza until you're confused if you are speaking or not speaking. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit comes, you know it. And as we're praying, we had a guest pastor, actually who's now in Chicago, Fratele Virol Pavel from Virgil Nagus Church, the assistant pastor. He was with us. He had lived in Spain for 20 years, speaks fluent Spanish. As we're praying, he says, there's a guy there on the second row, and he's praying in Spanish. Does he speak Spanish? No, 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 not at all. He's born in Canada. He's row English, as you guys are just the same, more English than row, but row English. But just to confirm, I sent my youth pastor to go stop him and say, do you speak Spanish? Not at all. Continue praying, praising the Lord. He had no idea what he asked. As the pastor went back to listen to him, and again, listen to me, this is not interpretation of tongues. This is someone who knew the language and by supernatural power, someone who did not know it was speaking it. This is as authentic as it gets. He goes and listens to him and he says, there's three phrases that keep coming up. One is this, Lord, my brother is also here praying for what you've given me. Give him also what you've given me. On one row ahead, his brother was praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's real. The second expression was this. In our family, there's a big difficulty. Please intervene and save our family. Do you know what was surprising and what they and we didn't know? Is that when they had come to church at 7 to start praying with us for the Holy Spirit, an hour later, their mom went to the hospital with an ambulance she had an emergency surgery and the doctor said it was the most complicated surgery they had done in their medical career the Holy Spirit was praying at church through her son without him even knowing or any of us knowing what was happening the third expression was Lord bring me close to you draw me close to you and if in this life you will not give me riches give me authentic experiences with you do you know it was really beautiful this was the first night on Monday, Starinza. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, not one word of Spanish. The only one night for God to prove he's real and still works, praise be his name. And the pastor said, I studied Spanish in university. This child, this my child, young man, had a profound and clear expression as if he was a fluent native speaker of the language. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit that I believe in. And that Holy Spirit comes as you go into prayer, go on your knees as you persist, insist in prayer. Do you remember a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, pastor back from 300 years ago, preached a famous sermon so powerfully that the deacons of the church embraced the columns of the church and were screaming that God would not open the earth and kill them on the spot. What was so profound in his sermon? His sermon actually is not that complex. 
It's online, you can read it. And he was not a good preacher. He was not a very vibrant, dynamic Romanian preacher. He was just a simple English preacher. Do you know what the key ingredient to his recipe was? The night before, he spent the entire night with his ministerial staff in prayer that God would anoint the message. And he preached a simple message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And those in the auditorium were so moved that they were afraid that God would kill them then and there. Our God is a holy God. And worship requires a protocol of humility. Allow me to end tonight by reading from Psalm chapter 2, verse 11. And then I would like to call you into prayer. Not worship, into prayer. Because I think we need a really good dose of prayer tonight. And I want God to minister to you. So I close my parentheses with that camp experience. When I finished my sermon that Thursday night, I said, I will show you tonight that the Holy Spirit does not need help. We do not need someone coming here and giving us some nice keys and oh, that's touching me. I want to give myself to Christ. No, we need none of that. The Holy Spirit on his own convicts and changes. And I said, we're all going to stand and we're going to go into prayer. And all the youth get up and we started a prayer that lasted almost two hours. No gimmicks. N again, don't think it's us. Do you think I have the power to convict, to manage, to mold, to manipulate? God, no. Look at me. Do I look that smart to you? Only the Holy Spirit can make such moves. Only the Holy Spirit is able to make such changes. That's what I want here at Night at Acro. And I venture to say that the pastors will not be upset if we spend the next two hours praying here tonight. Hey, three hours. They're willing to stay with you and keep the doors open because we really need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Psalm 2 verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. You know, you're happy you have power. Electrical power. All of us are. Look at us tonight. Do you know when you realize you really need power? Is when you don't have power. That's when you realize how crucial power is. If you are sitting beside one of those, whatever they're called, transformers or big things that make power or generate power, power comes through them, you would be happy. The thing that gives power to your house. You'd be trembling because that's way too powerful to be around. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun or honor the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Just a little, not a lot. Just a a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Beloved youth from Ekro tonight, you are the generation that has to bring revival to your parents' generation. Your parents' generation lived through revival. They saw the Lord. It pains me to say, I pastor a church and I see that our father's generation, unfortunately, is losing touch with that reality that we had. We're here today, unfortunately, where youth are confused because their parents did not properly pass down the heritage that God gave us. But have no fear. God is a God of miracles. And you are the generation that's supposed to bring revival back into our churches. Not through means of manipulation, not through worldliness, but through a reverent honor of the one who's an all-consuming fire. Of the one who can change, can mold hearts, can break walls. Of the one who can take bondage away. Of the one who can liberate from our sins. Of the one who can wash us clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. You are that generation. Be that generation. Serve the Lord with all your heart, in purity, in principles, in a protocol of humility. May God use you mightily in our churches. That's what we desire for you. You have a burning passion, a drive, an authenticity that we do love. I love the fact that at least you are authentic. If this is how you are, this is how you are. Good, be authentic. But allow God to change your mind, to change your heart, to shape you from within. We cannot do that. All we can do is faithfully preach the gospel to you. And as the Apostle Paul said, beg you, exhort you, please turn back to the Lord who truly loves you. Now then, by telling you the story of a man who was one of the greatest preacher of the past few centuries. A man who, being in an evangelistic meeting, heard the pastor preaching very beautifully. It was the evangelist Valerie who mentioned 
God will use mightily those who are truly consecrated for his name who truly give themselves over fully to the hand of God for his work for his ministry laying down aside all their desires and allowing God to shine in their lives fully God will do that is there anyone here who wants that and this young preacher Dwight L Moody said by God's grace I aim to be that man may tonight be the night when you who are present here at Ekro will choose to truly consecrate yourself for the Lord to become a youth that will honor glorify God in every single action of your life in every single way that you live in every single way that you behave may God do that tonight and as some of you are waiting to get married the Romanian dream every grandma at the baby room is trying to pair up little kids from the time that they're two or three they'll marry my grandson that's our that's in us we all want to get married as you seek and desire to get married and achieve that milestone I would pray you would greaterly and more earnestly desire to be consecrated for the glory of God giving yourself as a vessel for, for the glory of God show fear of the Lord in the reverence of worship in purity in principles in protocol may God help us amen let's all stand together and let's all go into a reverent prayer may God touch our hearts